In the Valleys, it's always been the working man's game, and I think it's a game where he felt he could compete on equal levels with anybody else. And that's why one of the reasons why he's proved so popular and why he's kept going. Uh, and the other thing, of course, once it started, it's produced this ethos that the Welsh, the Welsh are rugby players. Uh, I mean, if, if you go anywhere in the world and you say you're Welsh, you're expected to be able to play rugby or sing, or both. Like, I know traditionally uh, rugby has been the, the sport of the Welsh man, you know, and no matter where uh, or part of the world you go, you, uh, if you've got a Welsh accent, or, you know, everybody thinks that you're a Barry John, like it's... Uh... Well, it's, it's, it's been the religion, uh, isn't it? Uh... Ever since uh, time of memorial, like isn't it? And uh, the father tell you, you've got, you've got to play rugby. You mean, if in this village, if they seen a soccer ball, they put a knife in it. They wouldn't allow it. Wouldn't allow it to run about in the soccer ball. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the thriller running on that field, isn't it? Aye. To play for Brink Cathay. Well, it was me anyway. Aye. Play for Brink Cathay, like you know, when you want that thriller putting on the old shell and white jersey, like it is. I said, you can't explain to someone who don't, don't know it. We sneaked in rugby in this village, see, you know, uh, and uh, that's all they talk about, what it in the pubs. Your love of rugby stems from inside your own person. There was nothing my mother didn't know about rugby, you know. She really, what can I say now, she, she never missed an home game. I blamed rugby for a lot of things, you know, because I could never go and on a Saturday it was just gone. It was taken away on a Sunday. And many women like me. And you're eating it and sleeping it. Well, I've been playing a long time now and, uh, well, I've finished when I've had enough and I just haven't had enough yet. I've been 15 years and I seem uh, to be enjoying it more now than I ever have. So, when both my legs collapse from underneath me, I think I'll stop playing. Rugby has always been my main interest and always will be. And um, what I felt was I'd had so much enjoyment out of it up until the time that I finished playing that I did feel that I should put something back in. Well, at the time, I didn't think I was going to put 20 odd years back in. <laughs> but I have so far, and hopefully, I can keep going. Which is a hard, hard game. Scar you, scar you. You got a few scars. Was it worth it? Yes, a little bit. I, I, I feel it today, mine, but uh, forget about it. has been played in the Ogmo Valley for more than a hundred years. The game has developed alongside the collieries and shares some of the characteristics of the mining life. It is a physical and often dangerous sport. It demands a high degree of cooperation and team spirit, one man relying on the strength of another. And it could not have been developed without the support of women, although their contribution has rarely been recognized. Rugby still plays despite the changing face of the South Wales coalfield, an essential part in the valley life, far outweighing the usual consequences of the sporting activity. It's not just a game, it's a way of life.
be so popular in those days? Well, it was the only game that was going sort of thing, wasn't it? Because um, we as, as um, miners, as they call us, I worked in the brickyard and I worked in the coal. Um, it was the only thing that was going and we, we couldn't go and uh, catch all of a tennis bat sort of thing. And uh, golf, for instance, out of the question. As the money was earning, like, you know, we couldn't afford it. Well, it's the only game that was going that, that the working boys could follow. Boys, everybody was working hard and you know, all manual workers, like, and um, there was no need to say you were working eight, eight hours a day, and probably some of them was walking to work three or four miles or five miles to work, you know. They'd, they'd start, start in the winter, you know, uh, go out in the dark, come home in the dark, they wouldn't see daylight till the Sunday, or Saturday or Sunday. He would have a note to go out early, and if, he, if, if the manager granted, he'd be all right. But if he said no, he wouldn't go. I've come home from the pit with a block in my arm like that, working clothes, and gone and played rugby, and washed in the, after the match. Working boots. Played in working boots. <laughs> Everybody used to work on Saturday then, days, yeah. Colliers, especially, you know, they used to have a note to come out early, to play rugby, you know, they come up a quarter of an hour earlier, and they had to come home on the bus, and um, time of the buses was about, see? Before that, they used to walk, like, uh, so they had no to come out, and uh, they'd come down the service bus, so they had to sit on the step of the bus, now the conductor wouldn't allow them to sit in the seats in, in working clothes, see? So they all had to sit on the step. We had nothing, and we were stripping in the den, you know, and Bathing in uh, barrels sawed in half, you know, and uh, boiling the water on a fire. And, and we, have, we used to have one bath for the colliers because they used to be black. Come home from work, they working Saturdays and day sheet. And uh, there'd be one bath for the black colliers and then one bath for the clean boys. <laughs> and that's how we used to go on, you know. And no football boots or nothing. And we used to make stuns and put them in working boots, you know, and couldn't afford to buy football boots. And, the first time you had any showers in in Wales was when the collieries had washrooms made and the miners come up and showered and then they suddenly caught on that rugby teams should have showers and sports teams because before they used to have a bath for the top half and a bath for the bottom half and they could be in a church hall, in an old hut or in a pub. While they were playing the game, then the committee would be boiling enough water for the players. They bathed in tin baths, and the committee also shopped in the, uh, the shops along Hogwood Street, uh, having bread, cheese, some sort of form of victuals for after the game. The landlord produced the drink. What was the role of the club committee? I had to pick a team. They used to be allowed three pence, three pence for picking a team, and there was five of them. They had three pence each to pick a team. And they used to go to the Corbett Arms and do that. But then when it was a nice night, they walked on the road and pick it. <laughs> when, whenever the boys played home, my mother was down in the football field. Uh, with our oranges or our lemons, whichever she could get hold of. And if the, if the visiting team were dirty, they didn't get any oranges or lemons. My mother wouldn't give them to them. And while my mother was down there, we used to be making the sandwiches. A baker's tray of sandwiches and an urn of tea. Then we'd carry them down the street, which is about 20 houses, down to the Corbett Arms and set them up in there ready for the team after they played. And then we'd give the boys tea and everything else, and my mother would be there supervising us. <laughs> you were game with the local derby, so they were okay, wouldn't it? They used yeah. to leave the village. This village would be empty. Everybody would uh, walk over to where they played, they were okay. Uh, and so when we get in, played over, they were okay, played over here. 
You will be late, you will come over here. That's right. The terrace will be packed on it. And then when Mrs. Pepsi is supposed to be tripping one broke up on the touchline when they were walking stick. Aye, the crowd used to get right on the touchline then, wasn't it? Nancy Moor and the home of Hale, they play against one another. You see the band coming down with the crowd and the band going up with the crowd. And the mountain by the football field is all covered in people. And they used to charge them six months a time to go on there, towards the club funds. Everywhere we go, we'd stop, like, you know, uh, we probably had a dance in every village, and, like, you know, we'd, if we go to Moela, we'd stop, stop there for the night, see you, uh, never come back. And, uh, yes, I find a, a lounge with you, have a sing song, wouldn't it? Aye. Have a sing song until you thought, oh, we'll go, we'll have a good drink, and we'll go back to the local dance, so, uh -huh. once you have enough to drink. Uh -huh. <laughs> So was that not as much part of the game then? But, oh, the part? social said that was part of the game, wasn't it? It was the night out after the, the, the game. The night out after the game is stopping away, you know. Uh, yeah. uh, people didn't, didn't want many cars about them. They, people never should travel a lot, you know. And uh, we'd have this bus trip on a Saturday when we'd play away and we'd always make the best of it, you know, stay away and uh, have a good night out. Aye. Uh, we go out any time. Half past two or three o'clock, something like that. Never played with, uh, with lights, always in daylight we played. But Saturday we used to mostly take a day off, see. A five day week come in for men to take a day off. So when you, uh, when you went away, how did you get there? A bus. A bus booked for the season. Half a crown near and far. The club pay half and I pay half. One and three, one and three. I remember playing in Landa, in, uh, and uh, it was a very wet day, you know, pouring rain, so uh, after the match, you now uh, all the Landa people left, they left us there, you know, and they had no water, and there was an old stone trow, you know, all green algae in it, and uh, we used to stop away, <coughs> stop away for, uh, for the night in Cardiff, you know, when we, it was a rare occasion, like, to go away, you see, and uh, we was in this cold water with algae, you know, and it was freezing cold, you know. <laughs> well, walking around Cardiff, we were stinking, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think that I was looking in the ant in, in the antique shop, see, and uh, I didn't take no notice where the boys went, and I couldn't find a face I knew that. So I walked all through the main street asking people in the restaurants and, uh, and the hotels if any party come there, nobody knew. So I walked back to where I started from. First, first thing I see in the window, I was a pair of darts and dollar fifty. I'm glad to see you back. We played the jail, I think. I missed a bus once. Went to look for another fella, and uh, he got on the bus, and I was still looking for him. And they went, and I walked home. Thirty-three miles from Port de Nash to Ogmoville. <laughs> They were home at six o'clock, and I was home at half past. They broke down in 43. <laughs> you know the cab in the front, the driver was driving away, see, and uh, he was on his own, like, but the, the door used to be in the back of the bus, you now, see, the entrance to the bus used to be in the back. So, uh, shape stopping the driver, and one of the boys wanted to, uh, do something, see, so we went to the step of the bus in the back, you know, doing it, see. But when we got come back here now, we missed him. Right. So, uh, where is it stand then? Couldn't find him anywhere. He'd gone in the back and he fell off the step in Lan Aran. <laughs> <laughs> All gravel rash for it. <laughs> we had to go back to fetch him. Uh. <laughs> the problem I used to have, I'd be honest, I was playing for Ogmo. It all depended who was the bus driver, because I lived at the top end of the valley, which is about a mile and a half from here, you know, right? And uh, quite often it'll be two or three o'clock before you're coming into the valley, because we had players from Wick, and by the time we did our little built ground, you know, to drop them off, be quite late coming into Ogmo, and then uh, perhaps the bus driver, he'd say, oh, he's got something on on Sunday morning, and he wouldn't, and then I'd have to be traipsing up home. <laughs> about two or three o'clock in the morning with a bag, bag of 
Rätt en probably rinen det sen för det gäller den. Fast drink och så. Once we finish the game, where if we play away or home, like sort of thing. And then the first thing he would hear from the boys, how much money you got? <laughs> and then we borrow enough on that. Uh, only be shilling. When I played rugby, when you were playing away, the question on the bus was never, are we staying away? It's what time are we coming back? And then you'd have the players all want about midnight or, you know, so that you get a chance to go to a dance and sort of thing. And then you'd have the committee men then who used to go to the pubs. The pubs closed at 10. By the time they had fish and chips, half past 10 was late enough for them. And the big, the big quarrel was always what time the bus was going to come back. And, uh, right. and uh, well, now, I don't know, very often they go away. I don't think they got a team bus as such. No, they, no. They, because when I started playing, the Saturday night out was the big social occasion. Minus wives, girlfriends, of course. Uh, if we played away, wherever we played, we stayed. I mean, I can remember staying in Ogmore, staying in Brinkethin, uh, because they were away trips. Um, and that sort of held us together, and hardly anybody ever came back early. We all stayed. And of course, that is one of the things that has gone out of it, unfortunately. Traditionally, it was always if you were away, you stayed away. Mm -hmm. But today, um, it's an occasion. About twice a year, they'll, they'll say, OK, we're having to stop away. And uh, those that want to come back then, they either take their own cars or they make their own arrangements for transport. Today, they got their own car. If they, if they went to my snake and they wanted to come back, if they didn't come back by bus, they'd have to damn and walk back. So, it's as simple are, as that. They had right. to stop. They had to stop, whether they liked yeah. it or not. And we used to play as much for playing the game as the fun we had after the game. You know, the get together is one thing another. Well, that was every Saturday night, as far as I was concerned. We used to look forward to a Saturday night. You wouldn't go out for a drink afterwards, then? Oh, yes. Oh, I, I wouldn't miss that. Is that a big, big part of rugby? Yes, oh, yes. They all enjoy their paint. Before the war, there was nothing. There was no, you just play. And there's no, nothing laid on up, you know. Uh, if you do a way team, you just, away you go and find your own, buy fish and chips, and there was nothing catering, no catering for you, and they see. Usually, they drink in on a Saturday night. You understand? Uh, in in, in the, the weeks, the pubs and the clubs was very, very limited for the number of people that were in them. And mostly them were the old boys that used to go and have two or three pints a night and, uh, regularly, but they were the older types, the fatherly types, the old fathers and one thing that they know. But the uh, young boys were working hard, they couldn't afford to go out every night, they'd have a damn good time on a Saturday night and that, that was it. And it was, it was as simple as that. We had a pub, we had a pub at the bottom of the street, but I mean, very, very few women ever went in there. You know, there were men who used to go into the pub. We were allowed in there for the simple reason that we were taking the sandwiches and the tea in for the boys. But um, you, you didn't see women in pubs. It's not for, for a drink itself. I think it's, it's the company that you got and the social life, as they say. It's, uh, yeah. you know, the, uh, uh, the fun that you have and you... Um, Recall old times and uh, or remember such and such a trip, and you know. The attraction to me was the game of rugby on a Saturday and uh, a good, ah, a good social life. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's always been, especially in in this club, because we haven't had the success that other clubs have had. I mean, uh, I would say that you know you've played a game on a Saturday and played it hard, but then you come back and had a, a good uh, social side. Already oh, really good social side. <laughs> really, yeah. very good. Yeah. But I mean, uh, as I have been involved with the club a number of years and we've never been successful. 
but I can honestly say that we've had uh, tremendous times within the club, and uh, and so be you know, so let so, 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 so it carry on. Uh, in recent years, I've travelled around uh, with the rugby clubs and these local derbies, um, and it's the same everywhere you go, whether you're in the Garda Valley, the Maestate Valley, or. Certainly in Ogmobile, or even be between the two clubs are, um, and it's, it's always been the same. It's, um, if we lost every game of the season, as long as we beat Ogmobile twice, that was there. Uh, and that is Ogmobile's attitude as well, you know, it's... Uh, well, it's always been uh, a friendly rivalry, and uh, this goes back, I don't know how far it goes back, but indeed, uh, when I played, uh, even though some of my best friends uh, I caught Gwyn Owen, who, who played for Ogmo for many years. Gwyn and myself were very, very good friends, except for two days of the year. When he played for Ogmo Vale against Nottingham Oil, and I played for Nottingham Oil against Ogmo. Always big rivalry. Um, you'll find Ogmo and Nanty Mole is the game. Whatever side you were playing for, you'll die rather than lose. You know, like within the, you know, the, the laws of the game, you know, without too much thuggery and what have you, but yes, uh, there is rivalry. Just the same as there's between Garo and Pontikama, uh, and that'll be forever and a day, the same as over in the Ronda or where have you, two local sides will always, will always be rivalry. There were two rugby teams in the valley then, and Nandi Mole were separate. Of course, they don't count Nandi Mole or They're two different localities, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, I married a girl from uh, Nanty Moore anyway, so I can't say too much. <laughs> when we played, we played for the love of the game, and the rivalry was very fierce, contested. Everything. But after the match, we'd have a sing song. We'd go wherever we'd go, if it was in Nanty or whether it was in Ogmore. We'd go back then, and we'd the pub that we'd associate ourselves with, which was uh, Blaine Ogo. We'd have a sing song and we'd be all together and having a good time. When my mother was down the field, if we had to go down at all, we'd be one end of the field and my mother would be the other end because she was terrible. She was terrible. <laughs> she'd be shouting at the ref and she'd be shouting at the players, you know, and <laughs> she was awful. We, yeah. we enjoy it. We go and watch the matches sometimes before we, when we put the food on and then we go down for half an hour to see the first half and... I don't think the other side likes us there my, many times because we do rather shout, you know. <laughs> yeah, we get a bit of booze if you know. And start quarrelling. <laughs> In my day, um, if you play for Nottingham Oil, you went to secondary modern school. If you went to play for Ogmobile, you was a grammar school boy. And it wasn't only local grammar school boys, they came from Pencord and whatever, because of course in them days Pencoid, or Pencord as we call it, used to come to Ogmo Grammar School. And uh, I think it goes, I'm only speaking personally now, I think it goes back to them days and there was always a rivalry between uh, secondary school boys and grammar school boys. I, don't, I think possibly because Ogmo Vale was also the first Welsh Rugby Union club and Welsh Rugby Union status is a big status to have. I think because Ogmo Vale were the first Welsh Rugby Union club in the valley and not the oil didn't come back in, into its own until the late 20s, early 30s perhaps, is that they were all, always, not the oil were always considered to be the junior club. And of course when they played each other twice a year there was always a point to prove probably and that's where the rivalry started, but that rivalry still exists today. We don't mind if we lose every other game, every game, eh? oh, all the season. As long as we beat Nanty Mole, then do you? Quite right. It's it like is. Wales and against England. Wales got to beat England. England got to beat Wales. Like, lose every game of the year. That's one, one game you got to win. This is it. Uh, such close communities, there's a lot of competition, and they just stand in the that. You just, just want to beat them every year, you know. You've got to do it. It's strange, really, because I think if if the two teams got together, you could have a team that would hold its own with teams lower down the valley or, you know, down, down, down Bridgen. 
but you never get them together. I mean, uh, is this club packed up tomorrow? I mean, you know, they would never go to Nantes tomorrow first and say, can we join, uh, join ranks? You just wouldn't. I think it's the thing that's really kept the two sides going because we've both had bad patches when possibly um, the clubs could have folded. And I think that uh, what's more or less kept us going is the fact that if we folded, we would then have to join uh, the next club down, down the valley or they would have to come up to us. And I think that's more or less kept the, both of us going. I, I mean, when you think of that the Ogma Valley has, has run these two sides for over a hundred years, it is a bit of an achievement, really, that they've kept going, because we're only we're only within a mile of each other. I think whatever club you go to, you've got characters. I mean, uh, over the years, I've seen so so many within the club. I mean, uh, people who tell you that they're rugby players, and you know, they they give you all these past clubs that they paid for, and then. It, it, reality comes over when they see you run out when they see them run out on the field on a Saturday. I've had a number of those. I mean, I remember going to an a Bull and we being uh, being one short. So we had the bus driver who played for us. He's now I'm still a member of the club and fair play. He was a very fit man. He was about three foot six and about sixteen stone. And uh, we Huh? Don Bamfield, that's it. How do we all guess? And uh, <laughs> yeah, there we are. Well you know Don, I mean uh, character. But he played. I mean, he had to walk from every ruck and scrum and line out. But I mean, he got down the field, and I think it was in the in the pipeline to make him an honorary member of the club. But I don't think ever that ever came about. I can remember the time when my brother had his teeth knocked out. My mother was on the field. She was she was literally on the field. I, she made you feel really dead. But because somebody, had, you know, in a tackle, somebody hit him, and he had to have <laughs> My mother was on our field like a, like a shot out of the blue. It's unbelievable, you know. I and mean, I can see her now when my brother was laying on the floor. It's, a, it's, it's not a laugh at I know, but I can laugh at it now. Well, there's only one thing that's ever sort of stood in my mind on a rugby field, and that was when we had... Uh, a seconds game on, <laughs> and a boy called Martin Edwards was playing with, playing for us. <laughs> Remember, starfish. Yeah, he's starfish. <laughs> and uh, he was uh, he was playing on the wing, and one of the opposite team put up a huge kick, and it was a, a big kick, wasn't it? And Eddie on the wing shouted, "My ball!" And it hit him point first in the face. <laughs> Hence the name Eddie Starfish. <laughs> Out cold, five stars, <laughs> like that. I played in a, in a very match to about, to about 12, 13 seasons ago, and it was a sort of pre, it was a, a, a range of the spur of the moment. It was a 90 mile second side. So we didn't have an actual second side at the time. So dribs and drabs sort of went down on the bus. It was to Club Rugby in Cardiff. and. Um, our guest winger was a bloke called Ron Stanton, and uh, he appeared on the wing in um, a pair of slip-on shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was playing, I was playing outside centre at the time, and the ball came along the line, and we had a bit of an overlap. And I went, went to pass to Ron, and I could see this figure in the distance, about about sixty yards away down the field. Slipping all over the place in the slip-on shoes. So we played, I played hooker, and we played away. First half, 30-odd points to nil. Second half, I thought, oh, we'll have some fun. So we went down in a loose mall on the floor, and I shouted, my teeth, my teeth. So the ref blew up, and he said, what's the matter? I said, my teeth. And he said, let me see. So I opened my mouth, he said, you haven't got any. I said, oh, no, I haven't. I said, I know where they are, though. He said, where? I said, in my pocket in the dressing room. He said, you can bloody join them. <laughs> Set me off. <laughs> About two months ago, down in Cardiff, down in uh, Landaff, we was a, a player short, and he turned up finally, a bloke called, uh, what's his name? Brown Robert. Robert Brown. <laughs> oh, God, a, bit, a real nutcase. He turned up, and as he was running out to the field, he said, boys, anybody got any shorts to lend me? No, we got no shorts, no. Oh, well, uh, Anybody got any, anything else to lend me I can wear? 
No, you, you ran out in your box of shots, we, we told him, but he, he eventually ran out. He bothered a, a, a player's tracksuit bottoms. So, in good faith, this boy was about 16 stone, Rob's about nine soaking wet, <laughs> left him his, gave him his sort of really, really elegant tracksuit bottoms to wear. And what he'd done, he got a scissors out of the first aid kit, cut them to about Stanley Matthews length, got a bit of tape, of course, the waist is out there, wrapped the trousers round, and wrapped this tape round and round now. And, well, he ran out on the field late, and they were trouncing us, and, the ball was going along the line and he ran on the pitch and they just stopped and <laughs> applauded him as he ran on. Like Stanley Matthews, I've never seen a side like it in my life. <laughs> Went on tour to uh, Nottingham, this was so oh gone, about 13, 13 years, 12, 13 years ago. And the um, boy was, used to play for us, full back, he's been very ill recently, uh, Percy we call him. And uh, he was full back this day and we'd all been out for a drink. You know, the night before, a big drink, and we had a couple in the morning. And he was solid as a rock under a high ball. This bloke, really solid as a rock, you know, he's, he's great, good full back. And um, he was all there, and the sort of mood broke down. Scrum, he went back to the outside half, and he put up a huge up and under. And he was all expecting Percy to catch a ball at full back. So we turned him around and looked, and he was drinking a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, yeah. really a real, real dependable for <laughs> <laughs> Back to the early 60s when I started playing senior rugby first, and there were very, very few, if any, club houses, uh, any rugby clubs had club houses. You used the local pub after the game uh, when I'm not the mile, always used the Blaine Ogre, Ogmore always used the Corbett, and most rugby sides had their local pubs. Well, of course, in the early middle 60s, uh, rugby clubs, uh, rugby sides started having rugby clubs. Well, of course, the ordinary rugby committee man now, he also had to become a businessman. Because at the end of the day, a rugby club is a business and you've got to make money to survive. When the, in the 50s, clubs started to have their own club houses then, one by one, and six, by 60 and 70, most clubs had their own club houses. And clubs leaned on the women's section very heavily to help them to provide food and catering, you know, for visiting teams. Plus the fact that they'd done a lot of fundraising and what have you, you know, so I think things, since the 60s, we have seen more women involvement, but there was women involvement before that, but in a different way. Well, when I played for Ogwala Queens, we had, um, we had a, a lady by the name of Mrs. Radcliffe, and she was into her 70s when I played for Ogwala Queens. And she was very much involved, and uh, she did the washing, the kit, uh, she did the food before the games. Um, and we all, all of us boys who played for Ogmore Alicans at the time, always called her Ma Radcliffe. If we played away and we didn't get home until 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, on a Sunday morning, she'd be waiting on the doorstep. She lived down uh, in Bridge Street, and she'd be waiting 3, 4 o'clock in the morning for the kit, it would go straight into the old tin bars as it was in them days. There was no automatic washing machines and whatever. On Sunday morning, uh, they would be washed and they'd be up hanging on the clothes horse over the fire for the rest of the week. Now, she had a big involvement in rugby. My mother had a tub and a dolly. And then, as we got older, and my mother became a little bit a bit more money coming in the house. We bought my mother a jiffy, which was uh, semi-automatic. And um, but she still used the old mangle, that was bigger than her, the mangle, you know. Um, she'd be standing there. We'd be putting the jersey through the mangle, and my mother would be rolling them out, you know, like like pastry. They were coming out. And I remember the day my brother got married and I thought, right, I'll do the washing now while my mother's out. I'd done the washing, it nearly killed me. 
but because I hung him the wrong way on the line, my good deed wasn't very much appreciated because I didn't have the jerseys on the right stripe and I didn't have the socks all going in the same way. So my good deed for that day was out through the window. But as I say, my mother was lived for rugby. She really did live for the rugby boys, you know. <clears throat> and any, any of the, more so the Arlequins, because that was my mother's. They always used to call my mother Ma, always called her Ma, you know, Ma, whenever they came and if they passed at any time of the day, my mother's door was always open and they always came in, you know, and my mother never had a key to her front door, never ever had a key to it. We've never known the door ever to be locked. The, the women were washing the togs out of the and cut the lemons. Didn't they enjoy that? Eh? Do, you, do you think they enjoyed that? Yeah, oh yes. The other women supported their husbands, but there weren't so many coming to watch the match. Because it's a man's game, and they suppose they thought it was only men only. It was part of the Saturday, you know. I mean, if the boys were playing home, you just saw the loaves of bread there, and you knew they had to be done. <laughs> and you knew the oranges or whatever my mother could get hold of would be there. She wouldn't let you touch them, mind. She used to chop those herself, because she knew exactly how many she'd have to get out of those things. But it, it wasn't, um, ah, you got to do it. It was just that you knew they were there to be done and get on with it, you know. And then off she'd go. And the only time we'd have a breathing space is if the boys were playing away or if my mother was off on an international where we'd have breathing space until she came back home, you know, other than that, no. Used to do the washing for the shop next door. Yeah. She used to go in and scrub the shop next door, the shop as it is as it was then. And she used to wash for school teachers, and um, anybody that needed washing, my mother would do washing for them. And then we'd always have to drag it back up to wherever we fetched it from, you know. <laughs> but she, she that's where she got her money to bring eleven of us children up. In the, the, the women's role in, uh, say, when I was playing was purely passive. Um, apart from the lady who washed the kit uh, every week. Um, especially when we didn't have a clubhouse, no women participated at all. Of course, the, the business of washing the kit, somebody washing the kit has gone out a long time ago and we've used the local laundry or laundrette for many years now. Uh, the other thing is that if you have a clubhouse, you can't run it unless you've got support from the women. Over the years, they never had a clubhouse. So the women were never involved in any way, other than going down the park to watch whoever it was play, or and still with the food where they'd done it then, I don't know. But in some club or pub or whatever, it was always the, a pub or a club was a depot. Couldn't have been a, a vestry. Uh, today, their contribution to rugby is part and parcel it. Where in, in my days, it wasn't part and parcel. They, they wasn't, uh, well, they wasn't wanted. If you had a clubhouse, of course, the women, there's been a big involvement uh, with women. The women do the food for possibly up to 80 players on a Saturday. Uh, Susan Gunner and, Mar and Marlene Clement. Uh, they're doing it now, and there's been lots of others before them. Well, we're doing something for we the do it club, for, isn't like it? Like my know. son plays rugby, and Marvin's son plays rugby, and like we just do it for well, for the boys more or less. Because I mean, we're all closely knit and get on with the boys, and we just do it for their, you know, for their benefit, really. I think one team in the whole of the four or five years that I did it ever bought me a drink or came back at the end and said thank you. You're lucky you had one. Yes, one. one. Never had any. <laughs> and one chap even came and offered to wash the dishes 
which I thought was miraculous. Well, we never had that. We never had that. No. <laughs> Mind you, we did rather pale at the suggestion of coming in when I handed him the tea towel, but uh, I think it was a token gesture. <laughs> yeah, I remember when there were two little bit teeth doing it. Maxi and Bryn. Right? <laughs> so, but it's still cops. <laughs> they're hilarious in doing the foods, all right, you know, but they'd have faggots and peas. Well, let me tell you, you've never tasted faggots and peas like they've done it. <laughs> they cooked the faggots in the oven, right? Until they were, well, just hard. You know, they just thought they had to cook Tops them. And burnt. Cut. But the best part about it, they were already cooked. They only had to be warmed up with the peas, <laughs> but they just cooked them when I turned it over. And, and did they eat it? Oh no, the colour of the peas, I've never seen it, the colour. Oh. Talk about uh, lime green, and nothing on it. Back in 1955, 56, especially in the valley, um, there were no women going into clubs. Um, very, very few going into pubs. And we didn't have uh, the situation where husband and wives went out for meals together, as they do now, and went to, to pubs or whatever. Uh, it just was none. So I think that uh, the women coming out, so to speak, has made a lot of difference. Very home game, as well as kind of a, the other boys. Uh, their wives, girlfriends, are down there to watch a game and enjoy it and have a pint of a club with us after. This is, brings us back to being able to bring the children here yeah, with you. Yeah, this is it. Because then everybody can go out together. Yeah. Mm. I certainly, my husband and I go home from here perhaps on a Saturday night if we're up here. We'll go home about, I don't know, half a seven perhaps, eight o'clock, for the children to go to bed. Yeah. But we've both been out, we've both had a bit of fun. Yeah. The kids have enjoyed themselves, the dog's been around the field twice, and <laughs> everybody's happy. <laughs> yeah. Of course it had brought the women into the club. I mean, they're only honorary members, they're like in any club. But everybody on, they say, like, whether it's a good thing or not, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes perhaps it's not. But, but it's nice that the women can go with their husbands. You know, rugby's not so taboo now as it was. Well, the size I played for that, there was never very many women watching rugby. And I think it's, it's like that today in the Valley, man. You don't get that many people who watch. You get the occasional ones because they've probably got a vested interest that their son might be playing or their husband might be playing or whatever. But it was unusual in them days at, you know, at my time then that uh, you had women watching rugby. And there are some women who are interested in rugby, but unfortunately not very many. Actually, you know, I'd never been to Cardiff Arms Park. And there I was, sitting in Eden Park in New Zealand, bored out of my skull, watching the All Blacks play Australia. And there was John, you thought you, they'd given him a million pounds, and I was like, uh, <laughs> waste of a ticket. <laughs> I think my mother was the only I think my mother was the only woman that ever went, you know, um, as she was, as old as she was, and I, she was the only woman I could, even, could think of who ever went to the rugby, you know. And her ticket was there for every international. Her ticket was waiting, you know, for her to have. And I used to go down there then when I was young, as uh, my brothers was playing, and I, we used to go down to watch them. I love to see him slipping in the muck, you know, when they see a tattle, that is a... Uh... And I just, I just personally like coming to see it, and the atmosphere. And... I mean, I've always been involved from the spectator, spectator's point of view, but the fact that women are now playing rugby, and it's a growing concern in so many countries, not just Wales, then obviously the interest is there. So you have to say yes, that women are becoming more involved in the sport not purely from the point of view of spectating. Although it's still a, a minority, it's a growing minority. You played rugby or did you like to play rugby? We yes, did. Yes, we did run <laughs> quite a few years ago for charity to the women's side. Well, we had plenty of bruises when we came back. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Did you Oh, we enjoyed yeah, we it. Good really run. enjoyed. It's good fun. Yeah. 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 Well, we didn't have the rugby boots on, I don't think, did we? No, I think we were trainers. Yeah. But we had their kits on, you know, the colours, and yeah. it was really good. Yeah. What about women's rugby? I haven't seen any. <laughs> I don't know 
I can't see any reason why they can't play, to be honest. Uh, whether they ever become popular, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's the younger generation, I don't know. I don't know. I'd be willing to make food for them, but I wouldn't be able to play for them. <laughs> okay. yeah. We trained in the night to go down and play with them on the field. The first minute we had a rugby ball out. And on a Saturday night, after uh, going for a few drinks, have a tin and play passing on the road. There was no traffic about then. In the moonlight with the, with the ball and have a sling about. And you didn't have the everybody was working so hard, you know. You, you didn't have to sing. Everybody was fit. When players were working in the pit and they happened to be on yardage or tonnage in those days, if they had tried to implement the training situations in those days, I think the coaches would have been politely told to get stuffed. Inasmuch as men were filling between 10 or 12 or 14 tonne of coal a day. Now, if a man, uh, a ma it, what you've got to appreciate, a man working in about three foot or four foot of height, boxing coal to the middle, got to cut this coal, put posts up, load all this coal and what have you. Now he's, uh, he's been hardened up enough in eight hours of work. Now all he had to do then was to make sure that he could run about on a Saturday. Well, we, n we never trained. I mean, anyone who trained was, was an ambitious person who was trying to uh, get into a side like Regend or My Steak or somewhere. Uh, if you saw a rugby player training, you knew he was, he was off somewhere else. I mean, we just turned up every Saturday. And the happy thing about it, as far as we were concerned, was everyone was in the same position. All the teams you played, nobody trained. Uh, a number of years ago, I mean, you know, we go down there twice a week, but I mean, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do a lot. Uh, which perhaps was our downfall. I mean, uh, but with the Ainakin leagues, everybody is now conscious of fitness and coaching. And, uh, I mean, uh, money again comes into it, doesn't it? I mean, uh, you don't get coaches or nothing. Now, whereas we looked on each game as it came, we just took each game as it came, and, um, and that was it, so what? So we lost 40 nil. It didn't make any difference. If you train hard twice during the week, in the rain, in, on the wind, and then you go on and lose 40 nil, I mean, you feel a lot different that way. And I think that's, that's the difference between now and then. There is this different, different attitude towards a match on a Saturday. It's far more intense now than it ever was. And you've got the aspect then, I say, the, the physical minor. I mean, uh, I say, played with a number of them. I mean, uh, they'd come off, they, they would have worked a night, set, night shift on a Friday, and they, you know, they'd be the first ones on the bus on a Saturday waiting for the game. And, they, you know, I mean, there was, there was no need for training then because they did all the training within work, within the colony. I mean, if they were on a, on a cold face, I mean, uh, that, was, uh, that was strong enough for them. It's, it is essentially a valley game. It is essentially a sort of related to the collieries. And I think it is really a, a physical outlet played by men who are industrially hard, you see? Uh, and when you look at the old teams, they were teams of colliers. I mean, I, mean, I never worked in the, in the colliery, but um, the number of us who didn't work in the colliery could be counted on one hand who played, who played rugby for Nantum Oil uh, at the time. It was mostly the miners, and of course, a lot of them worked shifts, so they would be working afternoons or nights, so they wouldn't be, they wouldn't want to be training anyway. And they worked physically harder then than they do now. And I don't think anyone really felt the need for training. No, uh, the mines are gone. They went in 1984. And the workforce has been distributed to Ford, to Sony, uh, to all the big industrial combines of Bridgend and District. I've got to go to work on a Saturday morning. I've got a, you know, I've got a manual job. I've got a, slog a little bit like so so I'll be taking an uh, extra yard of pace should I say off my game you know just to 
make ends meet, like, and I got to travel to that job. So, you know, I got to go on a Saturday in my working clothes to play rugby. And I don't particularly enjoy that, to be honest, but it's hard, you know, there's just there's no work, you know, you just got to got to travel for work and you got to make these sacrifices. Yeah. In second class rugby. The thing is, when the colliery was open, the colliery was across the road from the, from the ground, you know, a stone's throw. You could come up the pit on a Saturday morning and walk across with a kit bag to the to the change rooms. You know, you're not talking about going down the gen working and then rushing from the gen, coming up here and getting organised to play rugby. You used to be able to come up the pit and just walk into the pavilion. I think that makes a difference. Isn't it? Before the colliery's closed, I think a lot more young people, people were working outside. outside yeah, like, uh, yeah. They had moved away a lot yeah, of people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they had moved away a lot. Mm. I mean, in the old days, you had people who used to live in apartments. Yes. That's right. And as a result, you, were, you had more people living there. Living inside. That's right. So you had more choice, actually. Yeah. yeah. Less people in the valleys now, with the mining community dwindling. I think more people working outside the valleys. The people are moving out there. I myself have moved up, yeah. And I know in my street there's about half a dozen people from the gym living there. And people are going vice versa. As I would say, it's, it's, a, it's a strong game in Wales, and I think a lot of it is from tradition and, and from culture. The fact that it's a game that has always been played, and I think up until the last perhaps decade, Wales have always done exceptionally well. Success breeds success, success breeds interest. If you, if you were under 11, your goal still is to play for Wales, and that is the be-all and end-all. It doesn't matter how they're doing, and they've done very badly this last two years, as we know. It doesn't matter. The fact is that that is the, the furthest you can go sort of thing. That's what the young boys think, and that's where they want to be. I should think everybody, whatever standard of uh, rugby they're playing at the moment, uh, it is always to wear the uh, red jersey of Wales, I suppose, and go to the National Stadium. I mean, that's, I would have thought that's the, you know, the whole ambition when you start playing the game. And then you realise then what standard you, what standard you were playing. So everybody's main goal, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Cheers. Play for Wales, eh? Can't play for Wales, play first class, can't play first class. Play for Ogma. <laughs> the village side. Yeah. The desire to still play for your country, still there in Wales. You know, they've always said about Wales, um, like, as in England, you've got, um, football is the uh, national sport, but in Wales it's all rugby, and I would imagine a Welsh fan would find more pride than our red jersey on than in most other countries. You know, this is part of the ethos in, in, of Welsh rugby that the children grow up in this atmosphere. First of all, they're expected to play rugby, and secondly, they want to because everybody else is. And this is what people talk about. I mean, that probably there's more been talked about rugby this last two years since Wales have been so bad than when they were playing really well, because people are interested in it, because that is, that is the one game that stands out above all else. My dad have played for Ogmoville and my grandfather played for Cardiff. My father played, but he retired because he broke his wrist. Any of you lot got dads who played? No. My dad used to play for Wales. I'm no Wales pretend. Please. It's it's like a big family then, you know, you, you go and you meet people and uh, I used to certainly made a lot of friends in, in Welsh rugby. It's, uh... it's always been it's always it's been more popular than than, than any other sport other than Ousy I can think of. You know, Ousy is a sport Ousy is the most prominent sport in our body. <laughs> uh, I'm glad I played rugby. I'm glad I played at the time when I did because I feel that that was the best time to play. I suppose everyone feels the same, I don't know. But I wouldn't be happy training twice a week. <laughs> I've been proud of. Um, I wouldn't be happy with the fact that we don't seem to stay away as a club. Um, I was brought up in that era and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, that's what I... That's the way I see rugby in my own mind. I always hark back to when I was playing and that's how I see it. Um, 
the players today, they're obviously enjoying it, otherwise they wouldn't play, and fair enough, that's the way they want to do it. Okay, you know, that's fine, we support them. But I do regret that it's not as it once was. I enjoy the sport tremendously, and I think uh, if we just enjoyed it and put the commitment in, it's, uh, it's easy, you just get on with it, you know, enjoy it. A couple of pints on a Saturday night then with the boys, like, great, Chinese on the way back. No, it's, it's all about, it is, it's what it's all about, it's enjoying it. It's an army to sport, get on with it. Oh, I think, uh, oh, rugby was, it was alive in the valley then, and it still is now. It's not a game, it's a way of life. No in betweens like black and white. The years roll on, the valley changes, memories will fade. It's the same old game, still be playing. There's no disgrace when you do not win. Roll on.